Good morning, Crossroads. Stay in worship with us. Crossroads Church. We're happy to be here with you this morning to worship with you. What a great day. My name is Casey Bruce, my wife Keisha. We're leaders here at Crossroads and we just want to welcome you to our family here. If you have any questions or is anything, if you are new here, come find one of us. We would love to show you around all the great ministries our church offers here. There's great ways for your kids to get involved, for you to get involved, and to grow in your relationship with God. Welcome to Crossroads. Please be the 
scripture says that when we when we give to God what belongs to him wave at me like this just a little bit so I can see you if you think God is worthy of your praise today let me see you if we give to him everything our time our talents that he's blessed us with everything if we give back to him what belongs to him scripture says that he will open the windows of heaven to pour out on us of his presence and blessings and that he not we he will defeat the destroyer we have to praise God because he's worthy but we praise him because that's our greatest weapon that's the biggest thing that we can do is to praise him our elders are going to come they're going to plant themselves where they normally do uh, some of them like to go up even to the the standing altars if you are in the back and you want to go there and you see an elder these are spiritual leaders in the church some of our elders some of our pastoral staff and, and the whole purpose of this part the only reason we pause our worship is so that we can give God a chance to do something. Maybe we were praising today and you thought, um, I don't feel like praising God. Praise Him. Give Him what He is due. And then He will open the windows and do in your life what He knows needs to happen. So we're going to keep worshiping. And if you are in need of prayer, that's what they're here for. Let's worship God today. Amen.
light that the shadows can't deny Your name cannot be overcome Your name is a light forever lifted high Your name cannot be overcome Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble
know it's you. We adore singing hallelujah, singing hallelujah, singing that we are here to meet you. Meet us in this place, God. I know your presence is here. But we can't do one single day without you. Sunday doesn't happen without you. Tomorrow, God, Monday doesn't happen without you. We'll do anything you say, but we will always wait on you. Can you just tell him that in your own way? God, I will wait and I will move when you say move and I won't be afraid, but I'll only do it if you're with me. I'll only walk if you're in front of me. Christ is made up of his family, his body. We are his body. And because we are his body, we do everything to help build his kingdom. And here at Crossroads, we could not do absolutely anything if it were not for you, those who volunteer. And so to celebrate you, to honor you, we are having our annual volunteer banquet on January the 23rd at 6 p.m. in our event center to register and let us know that you will be able to be here for this volunteer banquet. Please go to crossroads.church slash events or call the church office during the week 405-634-1495. Are you guys preparing for tax season? Because so are we. And here at Crossroads Church, we're so excited this year that we're going to be able to email out digital contribution statements. If you have any questions about the email address that we have on file for you, or if you would prefer to have yours come in the mail, you can give us a call at 405-634-1495, or you can send us an email to giving at crossroads.church. Many of you know that we have partnered with Deaconess Pregnancy and Adoption to help them in any way that they need. So we are going to do a baby bottle drive. In the Welcome Center, we have 
a table set up with baby bottles, empty baby bottles. We want you to go by, grab one, maybe two, and fill this up with change, all the change that you can find, and bring it back. We will have a, a bucket drop off in the sanctuary to put those in when you've filled them up and returned them, or you can bring them to the church during the week and drop them off at the front desk. So go out to the Welcome Center and get yourself a baby bottle. 2022 is here, and that means our annual business meeting is right around the corner. Board nominations are available in the Welcome Center. Take some time to pray, and if you feel God's leading, you can place your nomination in the box in the Welcome Center. Also, don't forget to check your membership status in the Welcome Center or the Southeast Lobby before or after services. You can also do this by emailing info at crossroads.church. This year, Royal Rangers is going to sponsor a derby race. This is a time for boys and girls, parents and grandparents to come together to build relationship and to foster creativity. This is one of our pillars at Crossroads Church. Royal Rangers mission is to evangelize, equip and empower the next generation of Christ-like men. This is an exciting time of year for us. Kids get extremely excited about building cars and racing them against their parents or their peers. You can get details about the race in the Crossroads Update, in the Southeast Lobby, or in the Welcome Center. So we hope to see you February 26th at 10 a.m. in the Student Life Center. You have a 100% chance of success in marriage. You just need to do it God's way. A strong marriage rarely has two strong people at the same time, but it's often a husband and wife who take turns being strong for each other in the moments the other is weak, and then together realizing that it's Jesus who's holding you. May the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you hold hands with one another. Good morning, Crossroads. How are you? Fantastic. I want to bring your attention. If you're new with us, we have a Connect card that's on the back of the pew. And if you've been, only been here a few times and you're interested in what's going on as, in our family, we would love for you to pick up a card and check the boxes. Fill it out with your name and your information, your email address. And when the ushers come by here in a little bit, you can drop it in the offering. You can put it in one of the offering boxes. But what we would love for you to do is to carry it with you. We have a guest reception through those doors and on the left-hand side in a glassed-in room. It's beautiful. We'd love for you to come and meet our pastors, meet our staff, and get more information about our ministries. We have a lot to offer for your children and your teens and for you individually as you grow in the work of the Lord. So we, we say welcome. I want to echo Casey and Keisha and just say thank you for coming this morning, but get involved. We want you as part of our family. And right now, it's time for the Sunday morning tithe and offering. Hallelujah. So our ushers are coming. I want to remind you that there's multiple ways for you to give. They're putting it up on the screen. You can text and you, you can give online, various ways. But I also want to give you an assignment to read 2 Kings chapter 4 and chapter 8 this week. It is such a blessing as I've meditated on it. We know about the Shunammite woman. A lot of us know the story where she sees Elisha coming through all the time and so she builds a room for him to come and to stay and he blesses her by uh, praying and she gets a child. The child ends up dying and he raises the child to life. We know that story very well, but then 2 Kings chapter 8, read that because that's the rest of the story. Elisha goes to her and said, there's famine coming to the land and it's going to last seven years, so pick up your household and move. So she goes to the Philistine land and abides there for seven years. But the blessing comes when she comes back with her family after seven years, the Israeli the Israelites have taken over her land and they've because she's been gone. But at the time she comes back, the servant of Elisha has been sitting with the king, recounting all of the miracles that Elisha has performed. And he had just told the king about how Elisha had raised up that Shunammite woman's son to life from dead. And that's the same time she walks into the king's presence and asks for her land back after being gone seven years. 
So the king says to her, you're the woman that they just told me about. And she said, yes, I want my, I would like my land back. And he says, not only am I going to give you your land back, but I'm going to give you all of the proceeds that the land yielded during the entire seven years. You won't miss anything that you left behind. That's the God that we serve. And that's what he calls restoration. So she was obedient in blessing the things of God and being a part of the things of God. And when it came time for her to have a need, he not only met it, but it, he met it with good measure, pressed down, shaken together. It was running over. And you think about a just a ear of corn, how much does a ear of corn yield through seven years? The seeds multiply. We have a God of multiplication. So as you sow your seed into the offering, know that God is bringing restoration in your life and multiplying it, multiplying it. God is not a God of just addition, but he brings you back to where you should have been and where you would have been had nothing happened. So let's pray over the offering. Father, we thank you so much. Oh, that you're so good and that you see us, you know us by name. There's nothing that doesn't happen in our lives without you knowing about it, God. You know exactly what's going on. You know the places of, that we count as loss. You know the things that we count as uh, given up for your glory. But Father, we know that you take everything that's in our hands and as we put it in your hands, you not only add to our lives with multiplication, but you use what we give into these offerings and you multiply it to this house. Father, our intent is to see this sanctuary restored to the way it should be. And Father, that means that you're going to give us from the north, south, east, and the west workers and provision to bring this house to where it should have been if we would have attended the whole time to the needs of this house. God, I just thank you that it's going to be better than what we can even imagine as the people give, as we work to see your hand moving in our city. Lord, as we take care of the things that you have, you will take care of the things that we need. We give you the praise and the glory. and We thank you for blessing each and every person as they give and those who can't give. Lord, blessing their hearts and teaching them so that they can give. Lord, as we pray over the sermon this morning, we thank you for the stirring of hearts, that the word will go forth and penetrate our hearts and minds, bring about a tremendous harvest in our spirits, that as we are unctioned by the spirit and we're moved on by the word that washes and cleanses, God, that we're able to share the truth with those around us and bring them to the knowledge of Jesus. Lord, we give you all the praise and the glory for you're so worthy. You're so worthy, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Good morning, Crossroads. How is everybody doing today? Everybody doing well? Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's warmed up a little bit, hasn't it? I'm so glad that it's warmed up and it's not quite so cold. Well, if you don't know me, my name is Pastor Mark. I'm the lead pastor here, and I just want to say welcome, whether you are with us in person or if you are watching online. Thank you so much for being here, worshiping God. Isn't God good? Isn't his presence amazing? We love God. We love his presence. Before I jump into the word of God, I've got a couple announcements. The first one is I had sent uh, about a week or so back, I uh, posted a video on Facebook, but I failed to mention it here in person, and this is an announcement that needs to be mentioned in person. I wanted to give you an update on the final result of our special gift or special offering that we received at the end of the year called A Home for the Holidays. What we did was we uh, took up a special offering on December the 26th. Some people gave a little bit before, some people gave a little bit afterwards, but at the end of the year, we raised some money to uh, send down to the nation of Zambia to help build churches specifically and especially for Assembly of God churches that find themselves displaced after 
the nation opened up uh, from COVID. And I am very excited to report that in that one offering, because of your faithfulness and generosity, Crossroads Church was able to send $20,000. $20,000. Go ahead and give God a round of applause to Zambia in one offering. In just a few weeks of of announcing it, $20,000. Thank you so much if you gave. Thank you so much if you prayed. Thank you so much if you gave big. We are just excited for the opportunity to to reach out and to make an impact all over our world. I want to make you aware of a, a special Bible study that we have launching in the month of February. It is called Save One, and it is a very specific Bible study. Um, it is an abortion recovery Bible study, not just for women, but for men as well. Um, we believe in the sanctity of life. Amen. We believe in that, but we do know that um, people who have walked through abortion, um, there's there's healing that needs to take place, and we want to. We're a house of healing, so we're starting this uh, Save One uh, Bible study for um, anybody who's walked through that. There's no judgment. There's no condemnation. There's only healing, and there's only the love of God. And um, so this is a special, uh, special Bible study. If you are interested or know somebody who might be interested, first of all, talk to them first. Don't just, you know, hey, give us their name and talk to them. Make sure that they're ready for it. But um, uh, you can email us at info at crossroads.church or um, you can see Amy Connor, our women's ministries director, and she can help get you plugged in or uh, the the people that you're thinking about uh, getting in connection with them. I do have one more announcement, um, and you guys know from time to time we, we do what's called Crossroads uh, Celebrate. We celebrate different things and because um, that's, that's what we do. It's who we are. We celebrate with our family. So I'm going to ask uh, Stephen Eibach and Claire. I thought I saw Claire here. Come on down the front. Um, we are, we're celebrating their time here at Crossroads Church. Um, God is kind of leading and calling them away from our church family. Um, he's opened up an opportunity for Stephen to go back to school to get his master's. And um, so they're going to come up. We're going to pray over them. We're going to bless them. We're going to release them from the season of ministry. God is calling them to kind of find a church home that's a little closer to home geographically and I'd say a little closer to home denominationally as well. And that's okay. And that's all right. We love Stephen. We love Claire. We want to celebrate them. We want to bless them. Um, Stephen has worked so hard over the last several years. I'm going to ask a couple of our elders to come on up, and uh, we're just going to put hands on them and lay hands on them and and love them and bless them and honor them. Um, And if you would, do me a personal favor. Um, Today after service, they'll be in service with us next week. Um, Hug their necks. Love on them. Tell them how much you appreciate them, um, and we love them and bless them as they are released into a new season of ministry for their family, and we believe God's blessings are going to proceed and, and follow them and be all around them. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We thank you so much for the blessing that the Ibach family has been to, uh, to this church and to this church family. We sense your hand and and moving them. They sense your hand moving them, and we are in agreement with that. So we bless them. We release them with honor and praise. And Lord, we know that you're going to bring the right people to Crossroads Church, and you're going to lead them to the right area and the right church and the right, just uh, the doors are just going to fly open. So we just pray anointing. We just pray blessing, and uh, we thank you so much. We glorify you. We praise you. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So before they're seated, if you could take a look, Claire and I both got the uh, black pants, brown boots memo. I think Claire wears it best. So. We're going to jump into the word of God this morning. Matthew eleven fifteen 15 says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say, listen up. Turn to your other neighbor, neighbor and say, listen up. We're jumping into a new series entitled Written in Red. Now, we're not going to be talking about the red letters that you find in the Gospels. We're talking about a different kind of ink, if you will. We're going to be talking about the redemption, redemption that you and I have that was written in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to get very real with you today. A lot of churches don't want to preach on the blood. Ew, it's gross. Makes me feel uncomfortable. A lot of Christians say, oh, please don't talk about the blood. It grosses me out. But I'm afraid, I have a fear, that if we neglect the teaching of the precious blood of the Lamb, then we are choosing to lose a part of ourselves. We're losing a part of who we are and how we got here and where we are going. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author, everybody say author, and finisher, everybody say finisher, of our faith, for who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, you and I need to understand first and foremost that God is not just a God who created us. He didn't just form us and create us and set humanity and this world into motion and then took his hands off. And said, go ahead, have fun. See what you can do on your own. No, no, no. Our God is not just the creator, but he's the author. What does that mean to you and I today? That means he's active and intentional in our lives. Meaning that as you read the word of God, you see themes, you see motifs, you see beauty in the creation. He doesn't just form us, he paints our lives like an artist would. Painstakingly with every brushstroke, with every manipulation of the clay, he forms our lives. It's more, it's required more than just putting brick together in some semblance of organization. No, 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 an architect communicates in every brick that he lays. He communicates themes, motifs, ideas in every window that is placed in the building that he constructs. Our God is an architect who's been painting, who is forming, who is shaping, who is constructing yours and my redemption. And the ink that he pins this masterpiece with is red. Because our redemption is bought and purchased with the sacrifice of his beautiful and amazing son, Jesus Christ. Your freedom and my freedom is written in red. We're going to be talking about the next couple of weeks written in red. We're going to be talking about the theme and the importance, the motif throughout the word of God of the blood sacrifice. Now hear me. We're not going to get, uh, some of you thinking, oh, 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 gross, ooey, ooey, gooey. Listen, the blood in itself is not a magical potion or, elix or an elixir. The, but the blood is a representative of the sacrifice of the perfect life and the death that Jesus suffered on the cross for us. So what others may see as gross, and I can't believe they sing songs about the blood, ew, I see a representation of the sacrifice that Jesus laid down. The word of God says, and no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down willingly. He laid down his life for you and I because he is the great architect. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. 
He's God and there's no one beside him. He's God and there's no one before him. He's God and there's no one who can match his strength. He's God and there's no one who can hold a candle to his glory. Before there was the United States, he was God. Before there was Republican and Democrat, he was God. Before there was this humanity, he was God. He was God when nobody was around to tell him that he was God. He existed before and he will always. He is God. And he loves us. You and I need to understand there's no such thing as free. Oh, that's... Come on, we got a whole lot of people trying to convince us that there's a little word called free. Ain't no such thing as free. Free always costs somebody something. What's free to you ain't free to somebody else. Right? This is true in our natural world today, and it is true spiritually as well. Salvation is free to you and I, but it's not free. There's a cost. Somebody picked up the tab for your freedom and my freedom. There's somebody who paid the bill for yours and my redemption. At one point in history, the waiter came and slapped the bill on the table and said, it's too much for you and I. It's the bigger bill than you and I can handle. And Jesus stepped in and said, it's all right. I got this. My pockets are deep enough. I got it. No such thing is free. There's always a cost. And that cost for your salvation and my, my salvation was paid for. And the check was written in the precious blood that Jesus spilt on the cross. Turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 4. Guys, I'm just now on my intro. I'm just introing the series. I've not even gotten to the message. We're going to take a few weeks here. Listen, we're going to dive deep into the Word of God. Buckle up. Strap in. We're going up this hill. We're going down. We're going to have a good time in the Word of God. Genesis chapter 4. It opens up an account of two brothers. Not just two brothers, but the oldest children of Adam and Eve. This is important. You and I need to remember this. See, Adam and Eve, they take the fruit that they're not supposed to take. And sin introduces the world, essentially all hell breaks loose on earth. Sin and death and decay, it all breaks loose on this earth. You see, God had formed a perfect creation. And then sin enters. And Adam and Eve find themselves evicted from their very first home. Adam and Eve find themselves the very first dysfunctional family. See, y'all think your family's crazy. You ain't got nothing on Adam and Eve. First homeless people evicted, can't pay that rent. You got to go. They got strife, they got problems. Listen, that's the thing, you and I need to understand this. We gotta stop holding up these ridiculous uh, barriers, not just for ourselves, but for, for what we think other people expect of us. Listen, we all crazy. Your family's crazy. There ain't no such thing as a perfect family. We all have our problems, but guess what? We got a God that we can lean on. We got a God that we can build a, our foundation on. And yeah, we, it's going to be our own little brain, a crazy foundation, but as long as you're building on the right foundation... Stop comparing ourselves to what the family down the street is doing. They're crazy too. <laughs> Chances are they're crazier than your family. They're just hiding it better. Adam and Eve find themselves the first family to be evicted, turned out from their home, and the first dysfunctional family. So this morning I'm going to read the account of the very first murder. You see... They go from being evicted to dysfunctional to murder in a short amount of time. I'm going to read this account. We're going to stop along the way because I'm going to pull out some truth. I'm going to pull out 
some knowledge and some, some, some of the word here. We're going to digest it. We're going to unpack it. We're going to put it in, the, in our internal crock pot, the crock pot of our heart, and let it marinate for a little while. So we're going to take our time reading this. The title of my first message in this series is this, The Blood Cries Out. The Blood Cries Out. Genesis chapter 4 says, She gave birth to his son and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift. The best portions. Everybody say best portions. Best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift. But he did not accept Cain and his gift. We're going to stop right there. Genesis 4 says that God did not accept Cain and his gift. And I find this interesting. That the book of Genesis takes the time to separate and to list Cain and his gift. And Abel and his gift. See, not only does God accept Abel's gift, he accepts Abel. And not only does Cain's gift displease God, it also, Abel himself, displeases God. God rejects not only Cain's gift, but the manner in which it was given. See, you and I need to understand this. Jesus says that he craves mercy and not just sacrifice. You and I need to get out of this idea or this thought that American Christians have that our gifts and what we give God is a financial transaction. God, I give you this, be it my money, my resources, my time, and because I give you this, then you are economically and obligated to return something to me. God, I give you this, and I expect this in return. God is a king. He's not a trader. T-R-A-D-E-R. -E He's not a merchant. He's a king. He's not somebody who just, he's not, he's not a vacuum salesman who comes to town, and you say, ooh, I like what you have to offer. Here's this, and I expect this in return. No, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And Cain gives, and he gives out of a poor heart. He gives just basically what he has to give to get by. You see, but Abel gives what? The best portions. The best portions. For so many years of my life, I was hung up thinking that God just loved certain people more than he loved me. Some people just got it, and I don't got it. But you need to understand that God is a God of principle. Now hear me. God is a God of principle, and he honors the principle. So if you want what Abel's got, then you need to give what Abel gave. See, we expect the blessings of Abel, but we only want to give what Cain gave. I want to give my... See, ooh, that's, that's, not only do we treat God... Like it's a financial transaction, we try to wheel and deal them, don't we? God says, I want this from you. And you know, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not going to give you this. I'm only going to give you this. And can you throw in an extra of this for me? Can you add that too? Right? Treating God like he's a used car salesman. God, I just, can you throw in this? Can I talk to your manager? Can I talk to somebody? Let me talk to somebody. I'm going to kick the tires a little bit. God, I only want to give you this, but I want this, this, and this in return. Will you shake on it? Oh, no, no. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He wants your best. Listen, I'm not just talking about money. I'm not just talking about money. Hear me. I'm talking about your heart. Money is critical. Our resources are critical. Why? Because it's the outflow of our heart. The other piece is our time. You want to show me 
what you love, show me your checkbook, show me your calendar. What are you spending your time on and what are you spending your money on? That tells me what you love. And let's get real. In the American church, we've gotten really good at saying we love God, but not really showing that we love God. Why? Because we put our time into everything else but him. And we give our resources to everything but him. And when, the th- when life gets tough, when the crunch gets on our life, church is the first thing to go and our giving is the second thing to go. God is a God of principle. Listen to me. You want to be successful? You want the blessings of Abel? Then give what Abel gave. And when you do that, you will release the blessings on your life. Why? Because God is a God of principle. Moving on. This made Cain very angry. He looked dejected. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Everybody say, watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must do it and be its master. Who's your master today? Who's your master? God says, why are you angry? Why are you downcast? Why are you all sad-faced? Why are you walking around all swolled up looking to, looking to hit somebody? You will be accepted if you do what's right. You see, Cain has every opportunity to make things right. God's, God's not trying to punish Cain. He's trying to teach Cain. You and I need to understand that our God is he's a teacher. He's, he's the author. He's writing his story on the tablet of our hearts. Everything he does is to teach us. And he says to Cain, you, why? If you do what's right, if you only do what's right, then I'll bless you. I'll accept you. I'll accept your gift. He has every opportunity. And this is the amazing thing about God's economy. Are you ready? In order for Cain to succeed, Abel did not, does not have to lose. Think about it. Think about it. In order for you to succeed, somebody else does not have to lose. And if you see somebody else succeeding, it doesn't naturally mean that you are losing. See, but we have this dog-eat-dog culture, don't we? That says in order for me to succeed, then, then somebody else has to lose. And in fact, if I've got to put somebody else down to make myself feel like I'm more important, then, then so be it. We've cultivated a culture of comedy in our, in our nation that if there's 10 people in the room, the brand of comedy that is popular is, is a joke that is funny to nine people and offensive to one. Right? We have developed a form of what's known as schadenfreude comedy, which is enjoyment and pleasure at the pain and misery of somebody else. And we've taken this wherever we go. If, in order for me to be successful, you've got to fail. No, that's not how God's economy works. That's not how it works. You want to be successful, that means other people can be successful too. You want to be blessed by God, other people can be blessed by God too. But we got to get out of this dog-eat-dog mentality. Cain is wrapped up in this dog-eat-dog mentality. In order for me to be successful, then Abel's got to lose. And because Abel's winning, that means I'm losing. Cain can turn it all around in a moment. He can turn it all around, but he doesn't. God is seeking Cain's repentance. He wants Cain to turn away from the path that he's currently on and to head the right path. But Cain chooses not to do that. God wants repentance, but Cain seeks revenge. When you don't repent, when you don't allow God to heal the wounds and the bruises of your life, That lack of repentance 
will turn into a craving for revenge. And God is warning Cain. He's saying, watch out, watch out. Revenge, that is, that is starting to creep up. It's starting to bubble up and bubble over in your heart. You've got to watch out. I fear that that's where we are headed for as a nation. I fear that we've slid our nation onto two polarizing sides. And each side is no longer seeking restoration, relationship, or communication. We're starting to seek revenge. You said this about me, and you said that, and then you said this about me, and you passed this law, and you blocked this law, and you passed this law, and you blocked this law. I want revenge. Revenge will never satisfy. Revenge, listen to me. Revenge is an all-consuming monster that is never satisfied. The more you feed it, the hungrier it gets. And God is warning Cain, watch out. Watch out. Let me encourage you today, let it go. I'm not going to sing the song. Don't ask me. It's done. That thing's like 10 years old. Now, can we move on past that song, please? I'm the one who brought it up. Why am I complaining? But let go of the pain, the hurt. Cain has every opportunity. He has every opportunity. And when you f- refuse to repent, you will be driven to revenge. One day, Cain suggested to his brother, moving on in the chapter, he said, Let's go out to the fields. And while they were there, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where's your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? So Cain, driven to revenge, filled with the desire for revenge, he takes Abel out to the field. When they arrive, Cain falls upon him and he attacks him and he kills him and he buries him out in the field. And what's interesting here is in doing this, Cain creates the first cemetery. The first cemetery. Now skipping ahead, we see that Cain is forever cursed because of this murder. He's cursed of man and he's cursed of God. Can you imagine Eve's response? Finding out what happened to her two sons. You see, Eve, we've got some bad news. Abel's dead. But what's even worse is Cain is the one who killed him. And he is forever cursed by God and man. See, I was trying to think of a modern day equivalent. And the first thing I thought of was having two sons. One is, uh, was murdered and the other one sentenced to life in prison. But even that's not a fair analogy because you, because you can be in prison, you can be cursed by man, but still blessed by God. See, but this is, this is doubly dangerous because not only is he cursed by man, he's cursed by God. Can you imagine the grief that Eve felt? Can you imagine? See, I don't know about you, maybe somebody who in, is in this place that can relate because I think each and every one of us, we've made a trip to the cemetery of our lives and we've laid to rest hopes and dreams because we need to understand this is not just the signal of the death of her sons and the cursing of her son. No, 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 no. This is the signal. This is the destruction, the murder, the killing of her dreams. Because just a chapter or two before, Eve is told that through your seed, the serpent will be crushed. You see, she's, these aren't just her sons. These are the manifestation of all of her hopes and dreams and her plans. What will I do now? What will I do now? I, I, I failed God in my redemption, my hope. My only hope to make something good of my life was coming through these two, and they're gone. Maybe somebody knows what it's like to lay those hopes and dreams. What will I do? Oh, God, what will I do? 
you don't know. I hoped so much. I put all my eggs in this basket. And it's gone. No little girl, when thinking of her future, dreams of divorce. No young parents, when planning their future, imagines a miscarriage. No one envisions the death of a loved one. But each and every one of us, at some time in our life, we've had to take those plans, those dreams, those things that we thought were going to, they were going to carry us through. They were holding on hope for them. And we've had to lay them in the earth. Oh. There's no lonelier feeling in the world, is there? He didn't just kill my son. Killed my expectations, killed my hopes and dreams. Nobody hears, nobody cares, and nobody knows. Nobody knows the trip that I've had to make to put to rest those dreams. Here's the thing that this account in Genesis 4 tells us God knows. God hears. Listen, listen to this. Moving on. But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, everybody say listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed up your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you'll be a homeless wanderer to the earth. He says, listen, listen. Your brother's blood cries out from the ground. Listen. Turn to your neighbor and say, listen. So you and I need to understand that listening is based upon frequency. There are sounds that are happening in this room right now that you and I can't hear. If I were to bring a dog whistle in here and I'd just blow on it and go crazy, you wouldn't hear it. Why? Because our ears are not tuned to hear that frequency of noise. And I think so many of us, we have lost the frequency of hearing the pain of other people. We've lost the frequency. See, we only, we tune out the things that we don't want to hear and we only tune into the things that we want to hear. Come on, we got, and we live in a world now where you can, Information is like a buffet. You can pick and choose whatever you want to listen to and tune out everything else. Don't get me wrong. There are some things we need to tune out. Amen. Amen. But let's not tune out the cries of the hurting. Let's not tune out the cries of true injustice in our world. Let's not... Listen, we cannot tune out the cries of the millions of unborn babies that we will never get an opportunity to hear. Let us not tune out the cries of millions of women who are battered in their own homes, abused in their own homes. We can't tune out this. We can't turn a deaf ear to this. Why? Because we're the church. And if we're going to be the hands and feet of God, then we've got to be the ears as well. If you're in this place and you feel like nobody else here, see, nobody else heard the blood cry out. Nobody else heard the blood the, 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 of an innocent man shed upon the ground. Nobody heard it, but God did. He hears you. He hears you. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. He's right there there with you if you're in this place today and your heart is broken he hears you the blood cries out 
the memory of that lost dream, that memory of that lost relationship, your broken heart cries out to God and he hears you. Have faith today. God hears you. The story The story reads like a tragedy, doesn't it? Death of Abel, the cursing of Cain, the despair of Eve. See, but the thing is, once you get to Hebrews chapter 11, you will see that, that Abel had to die. He had to die because he's a type of Christ. God is authoring the theme of redemption. In fact, Hebrews 11:4 4 says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was condemned as righteous, commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gift, and through faith, though he died, he still speaks. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You see, Abel is a type of Christ, and that he offered up as a sacrifice when he did nothing wrong. He's righteous, yet he's murdered. See, God is setting a theme of redemption. He's breaking out the pen, and he's starting to ink our redemption in red. He's moving salvation from the shadows into real life. He's giving us a glimpse of a clue of what is to come. You see, Genesis 4 begins with Abel offering up lambs, and then ends with him being offered up as a sacrifice. God is telling us to get ready. If I were T.D. Jakes, I would say God is telling us to get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. God is preparing us. He's telling us to get ready. Why? Because in Genesis, we see a man who offers up a lamb. But God knows that pretty soon there's going to be a man who's offered up. And that man is a lamb. And that lamb is a man. He's saying, the blood of bulls and goats is not going to cut it, but just wait till you see what I do with my son. Wait till you see what I can accomplish with my son. Now behold the lamb, the precious lamb of God, born into sin. Why? So that I may live again. Oh, he's a precious lamb of God. Come on, somebody in this place. Is he the precious lamb of God in your life? See what the blood of an animal can do. Just wait till you see what the blood of my son can accomplish. Wait till you see the sacrifice. You think a lamb can be perfect? Just watch my son. And it's his sacrifice that'll pay for your sins and mine. It happened the way it was supposed to. Say that to yourself today. It happened the way it was supposed to. See, it didn't seem that way to Adam and Eve, but it ended the way that it was supposed to. Eve lost her two sons, but it happened the way that it was supposed to. The things that you've lost in the past, the things that you have lost on your journey to this place, they happened the way it was supposed to. You would say, Pastor Mark, you don't know. You don't understand. How can you say that? You're right, I don't. But guess who does? God knows. And he's got a plan that I can't see. He's writing a book that I can't see, but I trust because I know the ink that he's using and he's writing faith and he's writing salvation and redemption on my heart and he's writing it in red. It happened the way it's supposed to things that are gone are gone but it happened the way it was supposed to God is turning what seems to be a tragedy into a triumph you may look around your life and say oh my, my life looks a whole lot like a tragedy 
Don't you believe it? Why? Because God is writing a triumph on your life. He's writing right now a triumph in your family. He's writing a triumph in your finances. He's writing a triumph in your heart. He's writing a triumph for your future. Just hang on. Just stay with it. It happened the way it was supposed to because God is a God who loves you. He cares for you. He wants the best for you. Just hang on. Hang on. If everybody would stand to their feet today. Eve had to take everything, all her hopes, all her dreams. Like I said, let go of them. See, she thought she was bearing them. What she was really doing was she was giving them back to God. Planting them as seeds. Planting them in the field of God's grace. So this is what we're going to do today. Worship band is going to go into that bridge of tremble. Pray. And when I do, they're going to launch into that song. They're going to launch into that song. If you're in this place, you got stuff that you need to give back to God. I encourage you to do that. Real quick, some of you, the thing that you may need to give to God, the thing that you, you may need to plant into the seed in the field of, of grace and righteousness is your own life. Stop trying to be the author and the finisher of your own life. Stop trying to control your own life. Give Jesus control. Let him be the Lord and Savior of your life. If that's you, then you need to come up down here in the front. And you need to stand here. You need to raise your hands. And you need to pray. And you need to seek God. Others in this place, you've got something you've been holding on to, a dream that has felt like it's died or something that's barely alive. You need to bring it up and lay it down and plant it in the field of grace. And give it back to God. Because the dreams that he has for you are even better. Just like the seed has to die in order for the plant to live, sometimes you got to let your own dream and your own plants die so that, that God's plants can, can be grown and, and be birthed and be bigger than anything you ever expected. Are you hearing me today? Can I pray for you? And then would you respond by coming down and worshiping God? everything that you got. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, come before you right now. I pray that your Holy Spirit would call and bring us to response. Some people responding to you as the Lord and Savior of their life, giving their life over to you and others bringing down the dream, the relationship, whatever it is, and planting it in the field of grace so that our plans can die, but your plans can be resurrected and brought to life. We thank you for these things, God. We praise you. We glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Come down the front. Come on, church. Let's pray. Let's worship him. Let's seek him. Let's lay everything down in the field of his grace. Come on now. Let's worship.
Now hear me. I feel the Holy Spirit on me. I know there are people here specifically. Let me, let me give one more specific. If you're in this place and you feel like something has died inside of you. It could be a dream. It could be a plan for business or a relationship. But something you feel like has, you had great hopes and dreams for something. And it fell apart. I feel the Holy Spirit specifically saying to you that you need to bring whatever those dreams were, those expectations were, whatever those hopes were, bring them to me. And I'm going to give you new, fresh, and reinvigorated hopes. If that's you, would you be brave enough to come down and find a place to pray? If that's you, I feel like there's somebody in this house that needs to come down and pray. If that's you, please don't be afraid. Come down. Let's pray. God's got new dreams. He's got new hopes. He wants to restore in your life.
today. That's for somebody today. He silences fear. He silences fear. There's no need to be afraid. God speaking to somebody. There's no need to be afraid. There's no need to be afraid. His presence silences fear. It drives away. In fact, it casts out, kicks it to the curb, chucks it out the door the plate glass window to never return. Fear has no place in your life. There's no need to be afraid. There's, there's, that's for somebody today. Heavenly Father, I just I, we claim that right now. For those who are facing and, and being filled up with fear, Lord, we let your perfect love drive out, cast out, throw to the curb all fear. Lord, we walk in your love, not in fear. We walk in faith, not fear. We thank you, God, that your love casts out all fear. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus. Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, oh, cause your name is a lie that the shadows can't deny, your name cannot be overcome, your name is a lie. God, you are incredible. You are amazing. We feel your presence. We thank you, God. We thank you that you're doing a work in our lives. We thank you that you're changing us from the inside out. We thank you that you're driving out all fear. We thank you that you're giving us hope. We thank you that you have a plan for us. You have a future for us. And that everything happened the way it was supposed to because you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And you are writing the redemption story, the story of love, salvation on our lives. And the ink that you are using is red because you paid the price. You paid the price. You paid the price for our freedom and our salvation. We thank you for that. We praise you and we glorify you. And everybody in the house said amen. Amen. The worship band is going to continue to play. We still have people praying at the altars. So you are dismissed today. If you're new to Crossroads, stop off. We've got cookies and a gift for you and our welcome center. God bless you. Have an amazing week. Volunteers, we'll see you tonight at our volunteer appreciation banquet. God bless you. Have a good week.